Hey there, welcome to the table. <clears throat> so somebody made the comment that um, I wasn't finishing the flowchart for these bot actions. It was JB. And uh, he's right. There was one thing on here I was missing. Uh, for the most part, when you draw a bot card, everything here is benign. Meaning that uh, if you're at war, and was it a war action? Perform the war action, right? Perform the first action. Perform the second action, if any, you know, and any time you do this, it ends turn. So there was nothing that we missed on those um, those actions. If your actions, if their actions never did anything, then they would just score points based on however many cubes they were discarding on the card. So the only thing here that we keep missing is like when I get to the draw bot card, I'm just not going through this flowchart, but the flowchart really just says do the first action, do the second action. So, and that's what we're doing. So there's nothing, um, uh, we're okay. We're not missing anything on this. There's no, um, no issue there. So I think we're, we're good. And in fact, I'm going to pause real quick and just make sure that I uh, caught the comment and didn't miss anything on Okay, I did, um, I went in, it was the uh, Papal Curia action that uh, um, Poland did, and we're good. We're totally good. Um, so yeah, I don't necessarily step through those steps. I go through those really quick, but these steps are, um, they're very routine. Now, one thing I, I did mentally forget is if none of these apply, you just straight up score the points that are uh, on the cube. So each cube is worth a point. And then, actually, here's another interesting thing. If they ever somehow run out of bot cards, they just spend a cube and score a point. I didn't, I wasn't aware of that either. So, uh, I think we're good. Um, now, um, a thing that I don't like about this game, and it's really funny because the RTFM video mentions it all the time. They were like, here's your actions, and you're going to just refer to your your uh, player aid for everything that you need to do. One thing that I'm realizing is on the player aid that I need to take advantage of more is we keep opening up the rule book, but look, all the symbols are right here. So if I, you know, I needed to know, like, what does this do? All PR is at war except you lose a land unit for every four. I mean, this is awesome. It's on the player aid. Um, so I need to um, not be such a goober and keep going back to the main rule book. So that's the first thing. The second thing, here you can see the bonus for passing, and I was trying to guess what it means. Well, right here, it shows you that in a six-player game, ding, 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 right? So uh, we're good there. Um, and then on the second page, um, this is getting into a lot of, like, call to arms, which we're not really doing a lot of. And I do see the rules getting pretty heavy when it comes to declaring war and having... Um, alliances and things of that nature. It can get pretty wonky. And also, when you do a declare war, <clears throat> you're going to lose two stability if you don't have a Cassus Belly, which we, we will have, because it's something you always need to make sure. And then you do your call to arms, which this is what triggers all this stuff. And then for each NPR ally that's called to arm, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and um, there's other rules, like you can... Uh, there's defensive call to arms, and then we're going to remove any cubes we have, and, and then we trigger battles, etc. And in here, you cannot declare war on an ally, on a realm you have a truce, on a PR that has passed, on an NPR ally of a PR that meets B or C, on an HRE member, da da da. Um, or while you're in interregnum, which is what we are. So we can't declare war. And so that's the important thing to understand there. Okay, now I am realizing I don't remember whose turn it was. And I need a marker that tells me that. So uh, let me pause the video again. I gotta go pull up my last YouTube video <laughs> so I can see whose turn it is. My apologies. Okay, it is the Ottoman Empire's turn. So let's go to the Ottomans. Um, well, basically, uh, Poland did the last action, and then they um, we retconned the Ottoman one because they were not allowed. So the Poland did the plague, which was very funny. And um, 
I realized that we could not change the religion because Constantinople is still um, an independent in the area. So we're going to have to take care of that. And um, they do have their claim, so they can declare war on Constantinople when they need to. But for now, it is what it is. So uh, it is their turn. They have less than four cubes, so let's figure out what they're going to do. Um, are they under attack by enemies or rebels? No. Uh, can they siege? I don't think so. If I remember correctly, they have everything taken. Yeah, they're just sitting on everything. They're not at war, so there's no sieging here. So let's go back. Um, no colonists. This is true. They're at war, and they don't have four left. They already picked an event. So they're going to pass. All right. So Ottomans are done. So we come over to here. And the Ottomans... Whoa. Just changed. No, it didn't. Okay, they're just... Just a different angle. Okay. <laughs> um, so the Ottomans now pass. And what's funny is here... I guess... Uh, Yeah, this board only has the first four getting something, I guess. I guess everybody else doesn't get something. Um, and what's interesting is, did the... No, the autumn... We, they just took the plague, so they should be... So everybody's ready to pass. Uh, England and Poland and myself are the only ones that are left. And so I would swear England passed, but I guess they didn't. So France passed, so we're going to skip then. And now it's to us. And here we are. We have this. We may not declare war. We may not enter royal marriages. We may at any time assign a leader from their hand as a new ruler. Player realms that end the round with no ruler immediately suffer a loss of stability. And we flip all of our royal marriages to the fire side. Um, so my hand. Uh, they have me playing as France again. Let me switch. I do not have a ruler in my hand. So maybe that's a lesson learned. You need to keep a ruler in your hand. So I'm screwed. I'm going to get a stability hit and all this other stuff. I don't think I have any royal marriages, so I'm okay there. Um, but yeah, we're going to definitely get screwed there. And I have one cube here and one diplomatic cube. So let's see what we can do. Um, influence, me. I don't necessarily want to forge alliance or claim. We could try to trade again or, um, I want to recruit. And I need to be careful because the maintenance costs do go up. So whatever I do now, I'm just going to be spending more money later. But I want to get some extra light ships out. And it's unlimited how many we can get. And I want to get um, enough so I can do all my trade routes for between all the different areas and not have to um, worry about it. So I'm going to spend 120 gold. I think I want to spend at least 8. I'm trying to debate whether I should spend 12. Uh, I have 8 maintenance I need to do, so I better be careful. And since I'm an interregnum without a leader... Uh, this sucks. And I'm going to lose two gold for going down one and all this other stuff. I, I'm not a fan of what's happening to me here. I think I might want to do a third one. And here's the other thing. In order to be efficient with my cube, I should get infantry to beef up my army so that way when I do declare war I can take otherwise I have to do another action later to recruit but it here's the it's all about efficiency of actions right um, it's more efficient to just recruit once however if I wait until the next time next round um, I won't have to pay maintenance costs um, but if whoever I recruit now I'm paying maintenance costs for and the maintenance costs can be brutal like right now I have two infantry so that's going to cost me two. And this is four, six, eight. So actually, I'm at ten because of my infantry right now. 
and then my my ships I have one uh, two ships so that puts me to 11 and then um, it's going to be 12 uh, if I buy two more ships and it's going to be even more if I buy more infantry. That's that's where I'm going. And my income right now is 13. So i got to be really careful. Um, I do have 20, which is plenty. And I have a diplomatic power here, which means I could probably do another trade action. Now, the trade action I need to be a little bit mindful of, because technically this is knocked over. And then, of course, he just stands right back up every time. Is there a way I can... Knock them over. Uh, no. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I can do to... <laughs> so... <laughs> Alright. And then... As soon as I pick him up, he stands up again. So, uh, anyways, you got it. <laughs> Here's what I'll do. Uh, to show that I, I did something here, I'm going to put like a... A real marriage token on it. There. That means I use that that guy. <laughs> um, okay. Fair enough. Um, so I am going to buy the two ships. That puts me down to 12. And then I'm going to buy two more infantry for four. And so the two infantry is going to put me up to 14 maintenance. But that is what I'm going to do. And those infantry are going to go into my army. Like so. And then of course we're going to get our ships out. And one of them has to go here. So we're connected to the new world. And then the other one I'm going to put here. I mean, see, you can boost your trade power in every place that you go. Right? So, um, but I'm going to put it here for now because I think Genoa is going to be one that we're going to draw the most. Well Seville should be a pretty fight. Actually no I'm going to put him here because what we can do then is if I draw Genoa I can always move one of these over and if I draw the new world I can always move one of these over. So there we go. So now I'm more centralized. I like the plan. All right so that ends our turn. Um, if we passed now we would have gained a gold but that's okay and that cost me a military cube and then we keep going. So now it goes to England, who is very likely going to pass. They're down to three. Um, they are at war, but they took everything. And... They have less than three. They pick their event. They're passing as well. So England will be on the last one. If I can find where it's at. Here it is. So England passed, and then uh, it's just us and Poland. Poland is very likely going to pass. Nope, they still have four. So, uh, as you know, they are at war. They have four cubes. They're going to draw a card. Flip. Uh, the event. Now, they already did the event, so what happens when this happens? So figure this out. Event action already taken. Discard the event card. Start over. Main turn structure. Okay. Which just means they're going to draw another card. Alright, so this one's going to cost a cube. So I'm going to move that over. And they're going to try to do a convert or a focus. Um, I don't know if there's anything to convert. They are Catholic, and they are in Catholic areas. Uh, this here, also Catholic. That's Orthodox, but yeah, they're at war, so they can't convert that one. They don't have full control over this area, so they can't convert that one. Yeah, they're going to do a focus. So that one cube we moved over is going to focus on expansion, like so. And that's it for them. So they did not pass yet. Now it comes to us, and we're not passing either. I got one more cube. I'm going to spend everything I got. And we're going to do a trade action. So let's go 
one, two, three. Then we're going to select all the cards and flip them. So let's see what we got. Bordeaux, Saxony, Genoa. There's that Genoa again. Champagne, Vienna, Krakow, or Lubeck. This one's out. That one's definitely out. And then North Sea, Genoa, and Seville. There it is. Seville is going to be better for us than the Genoa one. Um, much, much better. Although fish doesn't pay as well. So let's think through this. I don't have any of these territories. So I'll be able to move a ship over. So I have... I can also... I have a merchant I can move to. Because I, I have two merchants. So I can... I'll have two power for the ships and one for the merchant. So that's three power. That'll get me seven gold. But if I come over here to Seville, well, let's do the Genoa one first. Again, I'll have three power. I don't have any of these four cities. So that'll give me five gold. So clearly that's not as good. However, Seville, I have Seville. I don't have Lisboa. I don't have Porta. Ooh, see, these, all of these are Portugal. So here, I will have one, two, three, four, let me think about this, three, four, I will have five. So I'm only going to get five gold if I take the fish. And let me show you. I'll, I'll show you why I'm, I'm going to get five. So if I do Seville, I have a merchant, that's one. I have two ships here, that's two and three. This I can move over to make it four. Okay, um, so that would be four, and then I have Seville for five. Porto, I don't have. Lisboa, I don't have. And Sueta, or however you pronounce that, I don't have that either. So there's three of the four cities, they're all Portugal. So um, I do get five power, but it's five power for fish, which is just not worth as much. So the best card for me to take is the wine because that'll give me seven even though I only have three power okay so uh, now to pull that off with three power I gotta move this merchant over and then I'm gonna move one of my ships over so I have one power and then two, three. I don't get to count the merchant that's knocked over. Or do I? Actually, that's a good question. Because if the merchant's knocked over, it just means you can't move him. I think if the merchant's not... Yeah, let's just check this. Um, so it's a action... Diplomatic action 15. If you have an available merchant, you may do this. So you need an available merchant. So that's the thing. I need an available... So we're good. Um, so yeah, I ended up moving two merchants over there. That's fine. Now, later on, because I have two merchants there, I technically could... I think I could use both of them and count them as two power, but then I'm not going to both over. So um, the point of all this is... I'm getting seven gold because I need three power to do it and I have three power. The three power is the one merchant and the two ships. I don't have any of the cities but that's going to give me seven ducats and that seven ducats is going to be huge to help me get through this upkeep phase. Okay so now it's back to Poland who should be passing because they now only have three cubes and I'm pretty darn sure that's it for them. They they are at war, but uh, they go this way and then they go that way. So they're passing, and then so are we. We have nothing left to do either. Um, we have some free actions we can do. We can look at that real quick. Uh, change state religion, change national focus. This one, by the way, is a weird one. Uh, basically, you're going to take a cube, let's say, off of administrative power. You put it here for the focus, and then you take 
a cube from each of these and you give it to administrative power. So it's like you're taking two cubes from here and moving it to there. And so it's basically helping, you're rubbing from two other areas to boost one area. Um, I probably just explained it, don't don't take my word for it how I explained it, but, but that's the basic gist of it. And we can look up the details when we need to do it. Um, so you're basically focusing on administrative or, or diplomatic or whatever. Um, yeah, the only thing I want to do is appoint a visor, but I can't because I don't have one in my hand. So <clears throat> lesson learned, keep one in your hand, especially when you start the game with a sick leader. <laughs> um, all right, we are going to pass. And so is Poland. And that brings us to the end of the round. So Poland passes, and then we pass. Okay, this next part of the game, I did not read the rules. I was so focused on the actions that I stopped here. So um, we are in phase three, the peace and rebels phase. So this is where we're gonna have to, to uh, declare peace if there is going to be, you know, between the NPRs and the um, the whatever. And so I'm gonna have to go through these one at a time. And there's gonna be a lot of pausing because I'm gonna have to go check the rules. I mean, it's very clear. We do A first and then B, you know, this part makes sense. And at a high level, I know what each of these do, but in terms of the details, the devil is in the details, of course. And I'm gonna need to, to go through the rules to, to make sure I have all that hashed out. Um, the rule book has been quite good so far. Um, very happy with that. And so, yeah, we, you know, if I open up the, the rule book, I've got to close this first. And we go back up to the top. Um, the phase three, Peace and Rebels, page nine. So we go down to nine. And, and this is where we would start. So I don't know what kind of style you guys like. Uh, I am learning this as I go. So let's learn it together, I guess. So once all players have passed, the Peace and Rebels phase begins. Exactly. We're going to remove Cassus Belly and Truces. Remove all Cassus Belly and Truce tokens from the board. Now, there was a Truce token between France and England. I never bothered putting it on the board, but there was one. So we're good there. A player removing a Cassus Belly loses two victory points if not at war with the realm it is removed from. So as remember, a Cassus Belly is something you have to uh, to do. Now this is the part that gets wonky for me. Um, so I have to leave this section now and I have to go to claims. And the claims are, where are they? So Cassus Belly is 22. So let's go to 22. Conquest. Cassus Belly is a claim. Having a claim on an area provides a Cassus Belly against all others. So that is a Cassus Belly. The claims are. So you needed to declare war wherever you have a claim. All right, does that make sense? So um, now there's also one for Let's see, there's call to arms, there's a general one, an event, disputed. The claim is the big deal. Because if you have a claim on something and you didn't execute it, that's going to penalize you. And that includes us. We had a claim. So, um, that hurts. I actually assumed that this claim would carry into the next round. I didn't think it was going to go away. But that's what I get for not reading the rules, right? So we should have declared this war. Because uh, I definitely wanted to declare war on these guys. So this is something, um, uh, you know, needed to kick them out of my area. Um, okay, so while I'm done whining about that, uh, let's keep going. Before I continue, we also have to look at the bot rulebook doesn't matter which one because I made multiple copies so um,
Peace in Rebels phase. Bots remove truces as normal. Bots never have any CB tokens. So this is the interesting part. Because I told you in the rules that claims are considered CBs, but this is saying that a CB is not a that a claim is not a CB. Because it's saying bots never have CB tokens, but they have claims. You see what I mean? Um so that's the part that confuses me here. And there really are Cassus Belly tokens. That's separate from claim tokens. That's the part that makes this a little more wonky. All right. Um, so I have a question about that. That's an open question. If anybody knows, please let me know. Um, but, you know, if you're taking the rules literally, then claims should be considered a Cassus Belly. But usually, if I have a claim, it stays active until something removes that claim. And it wouldn't be just, you know, hey, we're at the Peace and Rebels phase. So, um, a Cassus Belly is an intent to declare war. Um, you could say that a claim is an intent to declare war. It's just, it's interesting. All right. For NPR invasions, bot bots may suffer a maximum of one NPR invasion. Resolve the invasion that will invade with the most NPR units. And then resolve ties alphabetically. And so you can see there's there's rules that are going to be in effect for the bots that's different than the main rulebook. So the hard part about playing with the bots is that you have two sets of rules you need to read. Because the, the rulebook's going to tell you, okay, this is what you do. And then this is going to say, oh, contraire, mon frere. Um, that's only if you're playing France, though. Um, if you're playing Spain, they'll say something else like uh, adios amigo. Um, so here we go. I'm wondering Yeah, I want to read this for a bit. Okay, I found it. CB tokens are removed from the board in phase 3 step A, right here. CB tokens are only placed on capitals when an ally refuses to honor your call to arms. So basically, if you have an ally, you call them to arms and they refuse, you have a right to declare war on them. That's what the CB token is for. You have a Casus Belli, a cause for justification for war because they dishonored your alliance. So this puts to bed my my issue. Um, the claims do not go away, just the CB tokens. Okay, I feel way better. <clears throat> to be quite honest, I, I was a little upset that I'm going to lose my claim. And it sort of didn't make any sense, just based on, you know, how the game normally goes. So all CB and truce tokens are gone. And if you have a CB, you lose two victory points if you're not at war with the realm. Um, that is true. If you take a CB, uh, usually it's a choice. But if you take the CB, then you, you need to follow through. If not, you're a, you know, a scallywag or whatever, and you know, you're a wimp. OK, if an NPR, which is not an active ally, is at war with any player realm, and none of the areas where the NPR currently controls provinces contain units hostile to the NPR. Now, PR is player realm. So uh, nobody's at war with me right now. Now, if I would have declared war on, on Andalusia, then the Granada Morocco would have been at war with me. Then something would have happened here. So they could potentially invade me. And then we would resolve the steps on page 36. So um, now here's the question. The bots also have, they're considered to be player realms in some extent. So we got to go back over here. Bots may suffer a maximum of one NPR invasion. So we are going to have to resolve the NPR invasion for each bot. So it's not just, hey, I'm not at war, so let's skip it. So it's saying we need to go to page 36. So now we got to stop. 
Jump up to 36. And here's NPR invasions. Okay, it's an advanced rule. I'm going to pause. I want to read this, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so I took some time to read it, and it's a little chunky. I mean, you got to chew on it a little bit, but so basically, an NPR will treat a bot like a player in terms of these rules. Okay. Um, all three of these criteria need to be satisfied in order for an NPR to invade the bot. First of all, the NPR is not an active ally of any player. That's going to be true in all these cases, because nobody's an ally of me. Or, or a, another bot. None of the areas where the NPR currently controls provinces contain units that are hostile to the NPR. Now, this is the part where... So it says NPR currently controls. Control, I did look up, has a very specific meaning. The NPR owns the provinces that have currently been sieged, but they no longer control it. The occupants, so for example, Poland took Red Ruthenia, right? Poland now occupies the area that Red Ruthenia Owns. So Red Ruthenia owns those provinces. Poland occupies those provinces. So which of them controls those provinces? Right now, the answer is Poland controls them. So the NPR has to have provinces that they control. And there has to be no enemy presence in that area. And the area, of course, is just the, the you know, the lines. There has to be at least one eligible target adjacent. So if Red Ruthenia had two areas and Poland took one of them, which they did, if there was a second area that's also at war with Poland, then um, that area would, could invade Poland, for example. So the target area that they're invading has to have a town. Um, that symbol keeps coming up. I think it's Vassal. And of course, I can't zoom in on it, so I have a hard time seeing the symbol sometimes. It looks like... Like, this symbol always screws me up. It's a rebel town. But that's not the one that we're seeing. Yeah, it's a vassal token. That's what it's coming up with. Vassal token. There's really not a lot of vassals in this game. Um, so, basically, they need to be adjacent and there needs to be a, a hostile something in the area. So let's talk about, like, we'll go through, first of all, us, nothing's happening. France, they're not at war, so nobody's going to invade them. Um, I was doing Poland, so let's jump over to Poland real quick. Poland is at war with Red, Red Ruthenia, as you can see here, and Poland has occupied... Um, the two provinces there. There's White Ruthenia, but that's not the same as Red Ruthenia. And, and you can tell this by looking at their... Well, actually, I take it back. That's all part of Lithuania. They're at war with Lithuania. Oh, look at this. No, Lithuania was their ally. How did this happen? I think I made a major screw up. And I'll explain to you why. So they were allied with Lithuania. Look, they have a royal marriage and everything, but see these provinces? That's all Lithuania. They control all of this, including the areas that we conquered. So we were at, we have Lithuania as our ally and at the same time we were at war with them. Because I said I was gonna attack Red Ruthenia Red Ruthenia is our ally. Oh man, I really screwed this one up. My apologies, folks. I wasn't paying attention at all. All of this is Lithuania. Okay, I need to think about how I can retcon this. Because this is serious. I can't, um... 
I mean, I guess I could just say, hey, I'm at war with Lithuania, but to be quite honest, I mean, Poland and Lithuania merge. You know, it's it's a big deal. They're supposed to be allies with each other, not at war. So, because that's what this symbol means. This is like, if we flip this over, that's the alliance symbol, right? That means that they they were allied with us and then they decided to help us in a war. And here we are, we're at war with something that, you know. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to take another province that has just as many things and we're gonna be at war with that. So for example, they could have, they have a claim on Prussia here. They weren't supposed to declare war on Prussia because Prussia had four of these and remember we did the calculation. Um, but over here, there were two provinces. So where can we attack that has only two provinces that would allow us to, you know, declare war on them? I'm looking at Estonia. They have four, which is not good. Um, technically speaking, they're two different nations. Like Riga is its own little nation. Um, but Poland goes all the way over here, and here you got Brandenburg, Pomerania, and I'm going to run into a situation where there's nowhere that only has two provinces. Transylvania has two, but see, they're in an alliance with, with um, Hungary's in an alliance with Austria, and if Poland declared war on them, that would create other problems. So, the quest to find something that satisfies this continues. It can't be Lithuania. I basically declared war on Lithuania and um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to declare the war since Poland is here and it needed to be next to Poland we'll declare the war on Brandenburg. Nope, can't do that because that's the HRE. Uh, we'll declare it on Prussia, because that's not in the HRE. So the problem is, is that's two additional provinces. So Poland may not have captured the whole thing. That's what makes this really wonky. So here, if you look at this, Poland has two available armies. If they would have attacked it, they would have rolled two more dice, the allies, or the, the NPRs. So if we go ahead and roll those, you can see they would have killed at least one more. So one more of these would be dead. So I'm going to go and take this and cause it to be dead. And then Poland has only one left. Um, so for example, if they would have occupied this and this, then you have this They're annoying. So we have another occupied token here, which we can easily justify with this. And then um, remember, there was a plague and there was other stuff that took armies away. We easily could have occupied everything. Um, now, to occupy everything has one other impact. couple other impacts. Um, that's two more cubes that need to be moved over. Which means they probably wouldn't have taken as many turns as they did. I am not going to retcon that part. We're going to let them take all the turns that they took. Because the two extra cubes was because they occupied two more spaces that cost more cubes on their part. That part is easy. We can retcon that. Um, here we can put the extra towns out. Right, like so, and then these ones are just backwards. All right, so that's our situation. And this one, uh, we're going to get rid of the claim token because they don't have a claim on Lithuania. So this they own, like normal. And so basically, um, Poland went to war and is taking over Prussia. Okay? Um, and my apologies there.
I was not paying attention that these are all part of Lithuania. So that was a big mistake on my part. Yeah, because Lithuania is actually our allies. And the other part of it is, is they generate their own armies, Lithuania does, and they would have helped us. So they would have given us um, some black troops, or when I say us, I mean Poland. They would have contributed their own armies to the war. And um, we didn't even take that into account. Um, so, again, my apologies. Uh, that was definitely a major error. Um, but yeah, we got this retconned. I am well aware that this was the first thing we drew a claim on, and then we said no because the four here um, did not match their manpower. So before we put those four cities on, the manpower was five plus one, that's six. Yeah, I mean, we didn't have more than eight armies available, but we did. And the reason we had more than eight was because Lithuania would have contributed theirs, and look at how many provinces they have. Lithuania is huge. They're bigger than Poland. So, um, again, my apologies. Uh, this is, a, I think, a very elegant retcon, because uh, basically the siege action would have just sieged more places. And it's still the same outcome. Now, to get to the phase we're in now, Prussia has no empty... There's no other places that, that Prussia has. They had no allies, whatever. So there's no attack. Nothing's going to happen here. Turnover. So now we get to here. Uh, these guys are occupied. Well, Lakia and Bulgaria. But again, there's no allies. And they don't have any provinces anywhere else. And we can just check. So see here? See that symbol? Um, there's nobody else around that has that symbol. This is all Hungary. You know, Kosovo has their own group of people. So uh, that's those guys are good and done. So there's no attack there. So that's done. Uh, England has Ireland to worry about. But we have the same deal. They, they took all of Ireland, so nothing to show. Okay, so I know that was really long, but some of it was because of the retcon. And most of it was just to make sure uh, there's no invasions to be had. So let's say that they did invade Lithuania and they only took that red Ruthenia area. Then what would happen is Lithuania has eligible adjacent areas and they would generate armies and basically invade red Ruthenia to get their cores back. And um, they could potentially invade other areas of, of Poland but they're going to prioritize their own cores first. Like, they have a priority to get back their home homelands uh, before they would try to take new territory. And so then um, this here would be just a series of steps that we would have to do to resolve the battle. So the MP, it's just like the Empire Strikes Back. The NPR Strikes Back. Okay, so I know that was a lot, but basically all that was just to say we're not doing anything. <laughs> Um, that's okay. This one, we are going to have to do. Rebels siege or move. So we perform this step if there's any rebel units on the board. Actually, there aren't any. So maybe we're not going to do this. We do have unrest. We don't have rebels. So for areas with both rebels and unrest, blah, blah, blah. So we're not doing any of this. For areas with rebels and no unrest, blah, blah, blah. So actually, this whole thing, nothing happens because we don't have any rebels on the board. We might soon, because that's going to happen here where we roll the rebel dice. <clears throat> okay. Peace resolution. Only occurs if there's any ongoing wars, and all wars are then resolved according to the sequence described in 10.1, which is page 29 and summarized here. Okay. In turn order. Resolve all wars where automatic white peace requirements have been met. So you can see, like, we got we got some things we need to check. And it, I love the fact that it tells us page 29. So we're going to jump to 29. And we have automatic white piece. And then we have different victory conditions. All right. So before I read any of that, I need to come back and make sure I'm being honest. Resolve is normal. 
Preferred in tour order as normal, Cuban players can resolve peace with bot enemies, as described in the main rules. When it's the bot's turn to resolve peace, it uses the flowchart on page 15. If a bot is now at peace, remove the bot's army from the map, unless there's any rebels or unrest. And then 15 oh, is this. So a bot's peace resolution. So they would, you know, go through, and we're going to have to go through all this. Okay, so, so far I'm not too intimidated by it. Um, it seems straightforward. So let's go check out the piece things. And this gets involved, quite involved. All right, so white piece. Um, in the video game, and I'm sure it's the same here, but white piece simply means we're going to go back to status quo. So both sides agree, hey, let's not fight anymore. I'll, you know, I'll give you back any territory I took from you, and you're going to have to give me back. Let's go back to the way things were before the war started. So it's what the people should have done in World War One, to be quite honest, and they never did. Um, so automatic white peace occurs if any ongoing wars meet the condition. These wars all end immediately. So sometimes you'll be like, hey, I don't want to end this war, and it gets forced upon you, the white peace. And in the video game, it's very easy because, like, let's say you have no navy. And so you got to get across the ocean to, to continue the war. And um, they took your territory. But it's not enough for them to, to force you to concede the territory. Well, after, like, 50 years of them controlling your territory and you not being able to get across the ocean... Eventually, enough time goes by where the white piece gets forced, and you do get to keep your territory. Um, but, you know, there's other problems that could happen. But that's video game talk. So let's get into this. So now it's saying C section 10.4. So they're really jumping me around. That's annoying. When checking for automatic white piece, count an enemy's active allies as part of their realm. So in this case, like if, let's say, Poland was our enemy, the Lithuania um, counts as part of the realm. Such a piece cannot be concluded separately with an active ally. If you conclude a white piece with a PR with active allies, you're now at peace with all of their allies too. And that's that's a video game there. So the 10.4 is a truce. So truces really don't Oh, add remove truce tokens where relevant. Okay. So let's just look at the table real quick. Automatic white peace. Neither side in the war occupy any of their enemy provinces, including provinces of any of their enemies, vassals, or active allies. So you're allowed to have white peace, and there's no separate peace with the active allies. So a white peace could mean that you're going to make peace with one person you're at war, but not all their allies. Total victory. A PR, which could be, this includes bots, occupies all the single enemies du jour provinces, that means the ones that they own, and this enemy has no deployed land units remaining. When resolving total victories, any active allies are treated separately. So all terms are allowed as long as any term-specific additional requirements are met. So now this part is where you have to use the bot chart. But basically, you know, if I'm playing against you and you um, have lost all your provinces, I can negotiate whatever I want with you. That's what this is saying. Um, and then separate piece with active allies, yes. Partial victory. Player realms deployed land units outnumber the deployed land units of their enemy 2 to 1. PR's deployed land units outnumber the total number of armies in their areas plus any deployed land units. Apart from full annexation, all peace terms are allowed. Inconclusive. None of the requirements are met. So you can do a white piece or a negotiated piece. All right, so then we get into this. Um, 
All wars where total victory has been achieved must be resolved before moving on. The victor must enforce peace terms of their choosing unless a negotiated peace is agreed with the loser. So basically, the loser can't just sit there and say, I refuse. So the victor gets to choose, but the loser could maybe give him an alternative and could say, hey, I know you, you're going to annex this whole area, but if you give me my provinces back, I'm going to give you 10 gold for the next two rounds, right? So you can agree to that and give them their provinces back. That's basically the gist here. So that's where player and player interaction can be a little satisfying. Um, that's not going to be the case with the bots. We're going to just follow the charts with the bots. So when peace has been resolved with another PR's active ally, da da da. After peace resolution, any PR which is now at peace must immediately relocate your units to that you have in a neutral area to the nearest friendly. Kind of each area zone is a distance of one space. If you meet the requirements for partial total victory, you are considered to be the victor. An NPR is always considered to have zero land units deployed. A player may end up as the victor of a war where the only terms they are capable of enforcing are really unfavorable. May prefer, if the loser does not surrender, to continue the war. And an NPR will always accept a white piece if one is offered. A bot will, in the case of an inconclusive result, accept a white piece. Okay, fair enough. Um, mean that you may enforce the peace terms that match the conditions. And here we go. And then there's rules for active allies. So again, automatic white peace, etc. And we'll go through those whenever we actually have allies involved. Um, and then of course the truces come out and here's the peace terms. So this is what I was trying to explain and this is what I was really looking for. Um, only one peace term is chosen. Any cubes gained can be placed in areas that are full displace. So white piece. Return to pre-war conditions with no compensation. Um, any player realms involved lose one victory point each. And that's probably going to be the bots as well. Um, so you lose victory points for it, but that might be worth it. Sometimes white piece is the best outcome. Uh, keep the current board state. Partial or total victory. So basically what this means is you're going to, if I occupied three territories, I get to keep them because that's the current board state. So occupied capitals have to be returned to the lawful owners, and there's a ransom of 10 ducats. By default, apart from the capitals, occupiers on both sides keep everything they occupy. However, the victor, and only the victor, in place of keeping provinces, may instead exchange them for anything of equal tax value that the loser has, return any of them, and demand that the loser pays them money instead, three ducats per tax value, and then uh, liberate. So if you're taking something that belongs to someone else, you can liberate it and give it to them, um, as long as they're not core provinces of the loser, and you score one victory point per tax value for liberation. So that's pretty cool. Get victory points for that. And then you gain an alliance with whoever you liberated. So uh, that's also cool. And you can mix and match um, the total ducats that you can demand has to be capped at two times the tax income of the loser. I think that's all pretty straightforward. I'm not going to remember all this, but but it's very easy to read and understand what your options are. Um, you can also choose to humiliate them. And that's in the video game too. <laughs> um, so occupy, all occupied provinces get returned. This is the thing. You don't keep any of the territories you conquered. But instead you're going to score victory points equal two times the tax value of the provinces that you just returned. Which could be some really nice victory points. Now, in the um, the video game, you do get prestige for humiliating. I don't remember how much. Um, but another aspect of the humiliation is you get a lot of money from them. Um, 
So max 10 victory points. The loser loses the same amount of victory points. So you're going up 10 and they're going to go down 10. That's pretty cool. No points scored from provinces returned to the loser's active allies. Fair enough. And, oh, they got a nice chart here. So, you know, versus human. Uh, boop, boop, boom. So if you're doing a, a bot enemy, you can do white piece, etc. Versus an NPR. Yeah, I like it. Um, there's vassalization. There's a lot of choices here, folks. So vassalizing, the loser becomes a vassal. This would not work against and player to player. And so you can see, like, it's empty. If you vassalize a player, you basically eliminated them. Um, I mean, yeah, they still get to act independently or whatever, but, but they basically do whatever you tell them. Um, and so you can't vassalize an enemy human or a bot. But we can vassalize an NPR. And then uh, that more or less, that's like the way Lithuania is right now. So, um, okay. Force conversion. This is an interesting one. You can convert them, force them to convert to your state religion. So you can make the Ottomans all of a sudden become Catholic if you somehow conquered them enough to force conversion. Secure desired succession. This is an interesting one. You have to occupy the capital. All occupied provinces are returned. And then... You score points. You add influence cubes. And you gain an alliance with the loser. That's an interesting one. Not quite in a video game. Full annexation, of course, is the one that people like to use a lot. Um, and then negotiate a peace. This is between human players, nobody else. And you can see full annexation doesn't happen with humans either. Okay, um, I'm spending a lot of time on this. This is a big part of the game, and it's also a confusing part. There's a lot of little itty bitty details, um, but the um, but the key thing here is that we're going to have to use the bot chart to figure out what the bots are going to do. Like, for example, if we had fully occupied something, you know, I would tell you I'm going to do full annexation. You just pick one. And, and the way you pick is based on just how much you've conquered them. Do you have total victory, partial victory, and you can see it here. This is a really nice chart, actually. A total victory gives you access to all the options, including white piece if you wanted. It's a silly option, but you could do it. If you have partial victory, you can only go to here. You can't do full annexation. If you have an inclusive result, then boom, you can only go to here. And so that's what, um, so if you have a partial victory, you can vassalize them. But in order to vassalize them, the loser has to be an NPR, and you have to have their capital. So it is possible to not have someone's capital, but to have everything else. A, a, a classic example is Venice. Let me show you Venice. In the video game, Venice is a pain in the butt. Because here's the deal. Venice's capital is on an island. So what ends up happening is, is Austria, their ship gets sunk. And Venice has a navy in here. And so Austria will take all of Venice's provinces everywhere around, but can't take the dang capital. Because it requires a navy to get across the water. And every time Austria tries to build a navy, Venice sinks it. And so you basically need... And then there's Venice down here as well. So basically, you're trying to make a peace with Venice, but you didn't take their capital. It's annoying because a lot of your options are gone. Um, most of the options, like forcing them to be a vassal, you know, making them annex, um, requires you to take their capital. So it's a video game option, but it, it, it works very well. And actually, in this game, it might work also, because uh, even though it doesn't look like it, Venice here is not... There's no land connection to it. So... Um, uh, it's a it's a it's a perfect example of how you could be struggling because you can't take their capital. Another one is Denmark, right here. This is the capital, and look at this again. Um, now this is you can march troops across the the water here. There are 
pathways. But if there's any navy in this area, then they block your troops. Like your troops are marching across, and then as soon as the navy goes into the to the water, then your troops immediately go back to land. They don't get destroyed or anything, but the navy will prevent any troops from from crossing the water. So you would have to have a navy strong enough to sink Denmark's navy, and then you have to control the waters before your army can finally cross. Or you just have to build your own navy and transport them. But that's the case where if you have a navy transport, then their navy is going to sink your navy, and then that is when you're going to lose your troops. But um, Denmark is another classic example of it's really hard to take the capital, but it's real easy to take this. So Jutland becomes yours, and you can't take this little piece here. I don't remember them ever having Gotland. That's usually Sweden. But Denmark is a real pain in the butt to take. Um, there's other examples, but those are uh, two really good ones. Um, Scotland. Uh, in the video game, these are provinces up here. So taking this one is a real pain in the butt because Scotland, you know, they'll have their navy out. And so there's a way to march your troops to walk, you know, across the water to get there, but then the navy will block you. So what you have to do is you have to take all of Scotland and basically their navy has nowhere to dock and then you just let their navy attrition to death. And then once the navy's gone, then you can walk and take that final province. And what I always do when I'm playing the video game and I'm playing as England, if I'm if I take Scotland and let's say it's like total victory, I took everything. Um, they don't let you annex the full thing because it, these values of these provinces are just way too valuable. You just can't do it in a video game. They make you do it partially, so you get to take you get to take points worth of of stuff. So. Um, one of the things people might do is, hey, I'm going to take Lothian because that's their capital. And it's the most valuable one. That is a good strategy. But actually what I do is I take all the dang islands. Because because I'm planning on declaring war on them again the next moment I can because I want to take the whole thing for myself, right? So I take all the dang islands in the back. And, and then I just take all the things that are painful. And then anything with mountains. Because mountains are always so hard to, to lay siege to. The, the Lothian here, even though it's the most valuable city, it's the easiest to take. <laughs> so, um, anyways, I know I'm rambling, but um, it's a video game concept that does translate over to, to this. So, let me, I'm going to take a chance, I'm going to look at the rule book. We're going to have to do some peace. And in every situation, the bots have totally conquered their enemy. These guys don't stand a chance. These guys are, I, I guarantee you, full annexation, full annexation, full annexation. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen, but let's do it properly and make sure you understand where the rules are so you can look it up for yourself because your situation might be different. And then, you know, just for my own benefit, I need to know because um, I need to get more familiar with this aspect of the game. So I'm going to pause, make sure I understand it, and then we'll go through it step by step. Okay, so um, once I started looking at the rules, I realized the rules are complicated, yes. There's a lot of options, yes. But when you're playing as the bots, just follow the chart. Um, you almost don't even need to look at the rules. Um, Sorry, I had to hiccup there. Uh, the The rules are as simple as this. You need to understand this chart here, which is an awesome chart. Um, so the bot chart is going to ask you, is it automatic white piece? And that's um, got a very specific situation. You can see that here. Um, and the requirements for white piece are well, these are the piece terms, um, but the the requirements for white piece are here. Neither side in the war occupy anything. Okay, so that's the first thing. Automatic white piece um, is the first question on the chart. The total victory is going to be the next question. And that's, of course, in our bot cases, that is going to be the thing, and so uh, we should be able to resolve this pretty easily. Um, these other nuances, um, they come to play when you're playing human versus human, because I think um, 
you may have very specific things you want to do. Nothing is more pleasing in the video game than forcing the Ottomans to become uh, Orthodox or, or forcing them to become Catholic. Um, it's just that it wreaks havoc on them. You give them all their provinces back and you force them to be Catholic. Meanwhile, all the people that they manage and are in control of are Muslim. <laughs> I mean, you basically just screwed them over. Okay, so getting back to this. We are going to do the bot chart and we're going to start with the Ottomans. So we start here. Automatic white piece. No. Have they achieved a total victory against an enemy? Yes, because they occupied everything including the capital. So they're going to annex all the enemy's du jour provinces. Don't let this fool you, it's just the provinces that they own that are controlled by enemy or bot. So they're going to place towns, unoccupied vassals are released, and they're going to score victory points equal to the tax value of whatever they just occupied. And yes, JB, I'm aware it continues, so we'll come back to this. <laughs> I know I make that mistake. Um, so I'm going to move these out of the way, get rid of these Occupy tokens. And we already have the towns out, and there you have it. Two towns are going to go there. Um, this goes away. And the claim goes away. They don't have a claim anymore. And in fact, I think once the war got declared, that claim was supposed to disappear. So my apologies there. Um, so there you have it. That is done. And let's go back. Oh, the tax value of these is two. So one point each. So there you go. Two victory points for the Ottomans. All right, come back. So we did this. And then there's a black line that goes over and then down and then over. If enemy still exists, flip war tokens to the true side. Uh, PRs on both sides may add claims where they have lost towns. That does, that's not the case here. Uh, remove bot's claims from areas where the bot now owns all the provinces. I just did that. For each claim removed, remove two unrest from the claims area and score two victory points. If able, and less than two core in play, spend one cube to place a core here. They do need to place cores. So, um, so a couple of things. Uh, we remove the claim, so they're going to get two more victory points. So he's up to four. And then I think it said for each one, remove two unrest. So there is unrest actually in this area. So this is going to flip and this is going to flip. So two unrests removed there. And we have to put a core out. Now the core I think was, wasn't it this upside down? Nope, that's Cass's belly. I think we did this before, where the next one, there we go, now there's a core. So I don't know why, if I do a search, there we go, you get these different claims, yeah, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what's going on there. Um, okay, so we got a core out, as you can see. go back. If less than two core in place, spend, oh, we got to spend a cube to place one there. And then here's sub five. Remove all other bot claims from anywhere cores are played. Uh, NPRs always accept. And they got to lose a, move a cube over to do that. Okay, so uh, they have it a little easier. They were able to put a core out right away. Um, I think there's a... There was something we were... Like, if these weren't core, how do you know? It's because the the shield underneath it is not a core. It, it gets wonky because you're covering it up, so how do you remember? 
Um, I thought there were tokens for that, and there might be. I just don't play with these tokens too much. Um, those are HRE. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to dwell too much on it. Uh, this is resolved. So it's going to be the same here. So with Poland, it should be exactly the same. They're going, they achieved a total victory. Uh, they're going to annex everything and enter a score points equal to the value. Then it's going to go down to here. Uh, they're fully gone, so nothing ma happens there. Then we're going to remove the claim. They're going to get two more points. And then they're going to put a core. And they get to remove some unrest if there is any. Um, the unrest, I think, is from the area, right? It's not just from anywhere. Yep, from the area. Okay, so here we got the same issue. Uh, we're going to return the claim. Actually, we just got to flip it over. Yeah, see, the first claim has the Casaspelli token. This one. See, now they're all sync. <laughs> I am going nuts. Now, what about this one? Core. Okay. It's so funny. Okay, so this one's core. We're going to get rid of the war token. This just requires a little bit of finagling. All right, got all those in place. kind of tokens are these? Oh, it's those. I'm just going to delete them. I probably shouldn't have done that, but that's okay. Um, all right, so this is one, two, three, four value, and then two for the claim. So that's six points for, for them. So they're up to six. Poland just scored big. England, same deal. Oh, this was always theirs. This one says core. And then the war token gone. So for England, they they already had this one, so they took one, two, three, okay? Uh, so that's three points and then two more for five. Now remember, they were at minus one, so one, two, three, four, five. They're now tied with us. And so there you have it. Um, that was the three wars resolved. And now we're going to move on to the rebel stuff. We're not done. There's still more to do. Scooby-Doo. That's right, we gotta go back up to page nine. Okay, we did peace resolution. As you can tell, that was quite involved. Um, the prestige penalties now. So, disputed succession. Flip over all marriage that still display their fireside. Each player loses three victory points for each of their marriages getting flipped. You can avoid this penalty if they are the only PR to have an alliance on the realm. That's fine. We don't have this situation. Players who now have towns that are occupied by enemies is going to lose points equal to your tax value, maximum five. As of right now, that should be nobody. This is me. I'm going to lose a stability, and I have to flip my marriage to the fireside. Notice that this happens after the penalty for that. So we're good to go there. Um, I don't think I have any marriages, so I might be good to go with that. So yeah, I'm going to lose a stability, and that blows, because stability is expensive. Alright, religious descent. Players who have religious descent, a religion other than their state religion, in any of their areas, must add 
um, unrest to one of their towns in each affected area. Players who have vassals in the areas with a religion other than their state religion must, in one affected area, either remove a cube or add one there. Okay, that was a meaty one, and it's going to take a while to get through, but now we got to jump back to the bots and go back to their screen because we're getting into this now, peace resolution. Prestige penalty is normal. They're not affected by this because they don't have leaders. Bots gain a maximum of one in this step. So, and then they're going to gain two for being at war. And if they have an administrative ideas, they get to remove them. Okay. And then they're going to roll rebel dice as described on page four of this rule book. So their rebel dice rolls are over here. So they're going to have their own rebel dice roll rules. We'll go to that next. So um, they get a max of one, whereas the rules for this was and any of theirs must add one to one of their towns in each affected area. So the bots are getting a maximum of one and that's it. Okay, so I'm mostly repeating myself because I want to make sure I get it right. So this one with diverse faiths, um, there's no, not going to be unrest because basically there's no particular religion for this area because it doesn't match anybody. Uh, but they have it here. There's orthodox here and there's orthodox here. So they got it in two places. So which one is going to be impacted? Actually, they have it in three. There's one here too. And the answer is uh, whichever one is the least tax value. Well, that's going to be these smaller ones, right? So this is actually a smaller city now because of the plague. It still cracks me up. And when you have a bunch of ties, um, it says alphabetical order. So the alphabetical order is here. So we're going to flip this one. And that's the unrest, and it's just going to be one. It's not one per area, which I find odd. Why would the bots get so easy? They gain a maximum of one in this step. Okay, I guess we're not going to complain. Okay, now we go to... But we're going to have to resolve everybody. So like with France, we should be good. With England, we should be good. Ireland is not Protestant yet. Um, Castile, we're good, except for here. But we have the diverse faiths, so we're still good. Um, Austria should be good. Poland is the one to worry about. Poland is Catholic. This is Catholic. This is Orthodox. So we got to get back into what exactly is going to happen to Poland. And what we have to do is we have to look up the definition again of uh, religious descent. Uh, a religion other than their state religion in any of their areas. So Poland's definitely getting one, but just one. And so it's all going to be, the, they're all equal tax value, so we're going to pick the alphabetical order. So alphabetical order would be here, or these, and here's Bessarabia, so we're going to pick this one. Because it begins with a B. Done. These tokens. Done. All right. Shall I run along now? Let's go continue the rules. Gain or remove unrest. Players still at war have to add two. Players with negative two stability or lower must add one. And then plus two, they get to remove one. Now we're going to roll the rebel dice. So the thing we've been waiting for. 
Each player must roll a rebel die for each of their towns or vassal with an unrest token. Rebel dice are rolled on a per area basis. The possible outcomes are described on 37. Okay, I think the possible outcomes should be on this too. Maybe it's not. Nope, battle dice. It is not here. Oh, look at this. So these are the Cassus Belly items. All right. Well, we got a. The player aid fails us. So diverse faiths is always considered a state of religious descent for all players, regardless of their state religion. Ah, so I gotta go fix that. I had it backwards. So that means this could have been a potential, and that's the letter A. So we're gonna flip this one, and the letter B is not gonna be flipped. This one's worse. Now if we come to us, we have to flip one here, and I'm going to flip the smaller one. So we got Unrest in Cordoba. Okay, now we got to get back to this. So remember, we're going to roll for each area. Uh, during Phase 3, Step 1, you're going to roll... Uh, it's not Step 1, but yeah. Uh, for each of our... When doing so, start with the active player caused by an event or first player when rolling in the Peace and Rebel phase. Area by area, and then these are the outcomes. If you have any military units in the area you rolled for, a rebel is placed in the area for each rebellion result, triggering a battle. Otherwise, you must assign each rebellion result to one of your towns with unrest of your choice in that area. Rebels will siege, take control of the province you assign. If you assign it to a core province, you must place a rebel town on top of yours. And, yep. Yep. And then it's just showing that uh, if you roll yeah so see you're gonna you're gonna lose a cube you're gonna exhaust something so there's other effects that could happen all right let's get rolling here we're gonna start with us and then we'll do the bots so the rebel dice are these and so I'm going to just grab two for now. I might need more later. We're going to come over to here. I have one rebellion there, or disorder. I have two actually here, and one there. So let's start with Cordoba. So we're just going to roll one of these. And I got the minus cube thing. So I'm going to lose one monarch pool of your choice and return it to the supply. I don't have any. So I guess I don't do anything. I That must be... I'm, that's good. It doesn't say what happens if you can't do it. Um, so yeah, I'm good there. And then the other one, we're going to roll two. So we got the rebellion, which I didn't want, and we got the two ducats. So we're actually going to lose two money. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, this one means that we're going to get an army. And so um, going back to here, so this is placed in the area for each result, triggering a battle. Well, the good news for us is it's this area here. So we're triggering a battle in this area. So it's just one unit. And now we got to resolve the battle phase. So when we do battle, 
we're actually the defender in this situation. So they're going to attack first. They have one unit. Actually, here you go. Uh, land battles, three infantry device, three inf the infantry dice. So this happens when we're doing uh, player versus player battle. And I think we need to look up NPR battle because I don't think the NPR actually gets to roll three. So I'm really, you know, stumbling a bit more on this, but um, let me pause and make sure I got it right. Okay, so I actually feel a lot better about understanding this. Now, um, so that thing where it says you roll three battle dice on your player aid, that's player versus player. When you're playing against an NPR, um, they roll one die for every troop they have. And the number of troops they have is based on their MC, and the MC is based on their tax value. So we've been doing that right um, almost everywhere. But what it means is, is when I'm attacking these guys, um, they're not rolling three dice, they're just rolling the one. And then the one key thing is when you're dealing with rebel units, they fight to the last man. Whereas the NPRs will do one round of battle and then they withdraw. The NPRs do have a special rule that if they have three or more units, they get to draw a card and that could possibly boost them and uh, give them extra uh, bonuses. But um, but basically in a nutshell, they're going to just roll their one die and then we're going to get to roll ours. So I'm going to roll theirs right here because they're the attacker and that is a hit on us, which is annoying. And um, that means one of our infantry is going to go into the exhausted pool. And then we have three here. That fourth one still gets to roll. And we get to roll four dice. And we got a hit as well, which is amazing because if <laughs> three of them missed. So um, I didn't bother putting the troop out here, but their troop died. And uh, if we didn't hit him, we'd have to go do another round and he would get a chance to hit us again. So we did win um, the rebellion phase. And let's see what happens next. Okay. Oh, right here. If you're unable to pay the monarch power, you must instead pay two ducats for each such result. So I lose two more ducats and I drop to 11. So remember I said nothing happens to me because I couldn't do this right here. It's stated right there. All right, so I lost more money as a result of not being able to pay that. But that's okay, that's how rebels suck. Okay, so this is if the rebels are sieging you, which in this case they're not because we actually had an army in the place where the rebels spawn. So that's why we did the battle and I lost my one unit. Um, now they have a religion and faith area. What's funny is it just ends. It doesn't actually say anything. They fight to the last man. And they could potentially siege a province and then they're done. Um, it is possible that they will move as well. That happens in a video game as well. So it's a little annoying. All right, let's get back to page nine. So we finished rolling our rebel dice. Possible outcomes here. And then we would move to phase four, which we're not quite done yet because now we got to do the bots. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close this. We're going to open up the bot chart. And now we're dealing with the rebel dice. And it says go to page four, which is this page. And so they have their own little rebel dice thing. The bots are going to roll rebel dice for all their um, unrest at once, not area by area. And they roll a maximum of five dice. A bot can lose a maximum of one cube each time it has to roll rebel dice regardless of the number of dice rolled. 
Use standard bot choices on page 3 for applying rebellions and removing, except they will always apply rebellions in the area where their army is located, if it is located. Bots place a claim in the area if one of their provinces are liberated. Okay, fair enough. So the only thing I didn't understand was... Oh, they lose a maximum of one each time it has to roll rebel dice. So, because right here, I see. So, if we get multiple of these results, they're only going to lose one cube. Even if all five dice say lose one cube. That sucks. I'm not happy about that, but that's okay. Alright, so let's do this in order. Uh, we're going to start with the Ottomans. They have one, two, two. I'm sorry. Yeah, one, two. So they're going to roll two dice. And I got two dice right here, so let's roll them. Alright, so we got remove unrest. And I'm pretty sure that's exactly what it means for them. Yeah, they're going to remove one, so well done Ottomans. They got rid of both of their unrests. Boom and boom. Okay, then we go here. There's one for Poland. So we'll come over here, we're going to roll one die. And they got the lose a cube. So Poland will just lose a cube. Done. We go to England. They have one. I think they have two. Two. Three. <laughs> I gotta pay more attention. England has three. We're gonna roll oops. Roll two of them here. So the two ducats, the rebellion, and exhaust manpower. All right, let's figure out what that means for them. So the two ducats is going to make them lose a cube. The rebellion is a rebellion, and the manpower is lose a cube. So remember, the rules say they only lose a maximum of one cube. And the rebellion part... I think is going to be, yeah, it's per the rules. So uh, let's take away their one cube first. So now the rebellion is going to occur, and we have to use the choices thing. So it's going to be, uh, remember, uh, they always choose their lowest income area. So this one has two income. This one has three. Oh, looks, there's another rebellion die we need to roll. It was hiding from us. They got a lot. Okay, that's a nothing. Alright, so we're done there. Okay, so this one is still, I think, the least rebellion. But the problem is, yeah, they don't have armies anywhere. Their army was here. So what happens is they actually get a rebel, and they're on the board, and they're going to lay siege to that town. So we gotta grab a rebellion town, and it goes on top. And what this is basically saying is that the rebellions have captured that town. So the English will have to send in their army and actually attack and do war and re-siege that town back. So that's gonna be part of the decision tree when they're doing their actions. And one of the questions was, is did they, um, do they need to defend themselves against rebellion? And that's exactly going to be the case here. Uh, although this one, there is no defense. They they lost that town. Um, it's currently controlled by rebels. Happens all the time in the video games, by the way. Is they, They're annoying that way. Okay, th that was England. So we're sort of going in this wonky order. Um, let's do Austria. I think Austria is solid. They are. Let's do France. They're also solid. And then uh, we already did us, so we're done. That was relatively painless. So now we move to phase four. 
And this should also be in our player aid. Income and upkeep. So you can cut costs. So basically you can fire anybody you need to fire. You can dismiss any military you need to dismiss. All that stuff is possible. And what I would like to be able to do is just use this to resolve everything. Like So like if we went through all this, right, um, this has a lot of steps to it. That does as well. Um, prestige penalties, I'm not going to remember. This one, of course, is on the card. But you see what I mean? I mean, it's nice summary, but it's not very helpful. Whereas here, look, they got the formula right there. That's helpful. And then, of course, the corruption. And <laughs> you get this if you have more than 50 ducats in your treasury. So I guess as soon as you, as soon as you start getting rich, you get corruption issues. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay. Let's do it through the big rules. And then we'll go from there. And remember, income and upkeep for us is going to be different than for the bots. So we're going to have to go through these separate. So let's do us first. Um, so we're allowed to take but not repay loans. So cut costs. We can fire anybody. We can disband military. And if we do, they go to the available manpower. They don't go to the exhausted. And we recall ships at sea. Um, I don't want to do any of this. So let's move on. So we're going to collect our base tax income. That's going to be right on our player board. If we had any vassals, we would get income from the vassal track. We have to pay for our advisors. We pay for our military maintenance. And you can see, bing, bing, bing. Interest on loans, we don't have any. We don't have any plague, which is going to be funny when we get to them. Then we have our stability modifier. And this is going to suck because we're going to lose two because of that. We're not in the HRE, Emperor, so we don't get anything there. Um, we don't get anything for ideas. Because we do have an idea, but it doesn't give us extra income. So let's go ahead and just collect our income before we keep going. And it's very straightforward, and I think I have it calculated properly. So um, this is 2, 4, so that's 6. This is 8. So 8 income loss there. 9, 10, 11, and then these two ships are 12, and then this ship, and this ship is 13. Now, I had 14 on here, but if you remember, one of my troops died in the rebellion, so that made my, my, uh, <laughs> my, my expenses go down, so it was cheaper. So, I'm going to lose 13, I currently have 11. Now, don't panic yet, I haven't collected my income. My income is 7 plus 6. It's real easy because the bo player board is awesome. So I do get 13 and I owe 13. So basically my upkeep is fully paid for and I stay at 11. And I'm very happy with that. 11 and breaking even is perfect because these advisors are pretty awesome if you ask me. The only thing missing is my leader. So we made it through the collect income minus costs with flying colors. Very happy about that. Corruption. Uh, as you can see, we don't have to worry about corruption, but eventually you're going to start having to, you're going to lose administrative cubes. Um, then we're going to collect our monarch power. And you have to gain a loan for every unpaid cube. This is crazy. So we don't want to be rolling in too much dough. Um, so then we collect our monarch power as follows. So uh, we're going to add our ruler skill. And a person in Interregnum is considered to have a base of one in each, which just is horrible. So right now, I'm going to get one, 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 because we, we have an interim. We're basically in a regency. See here at the bottom, one, one, one. Uh, my previous ruler, you know, would have given me potentially more. Then if you have plus three stability, you get two more. Minus three, you get one less. Um, the Papal Controller gets the Diplomacy, which hurts me because we were the Papal Controller. They get theirs, and then certain government ideas give you additional. And then, um, the source type to that of the appropriate advisor. And so um, here, you can see the advisor is going to give us plus two. 
So we actually get two more. This one gives us plus three, so we're going to get three more. And then this one gives us plus two. So we're going to be more or less the same as when we started the game. We got one extra cube here, and that's not bad considering we have a crappy ruler. And it's because of our advisors. The advisors are what's keeping us with the cubes. They're keeping the spice flowing. Okay, um, then we score prestige. If you're uncontested papal controller, you score prestige equal to the number of Catholic PRs minus one. Now, I don't know if the bots score this prestige, so we're not going to score. We don't have Emperor. We don't have Absolute Monarchy. We don't have any active Crusades. So none of this applies to us. Then we do cleanup. Um, all players must disband allied units and armies. So like if you had allied units that were at war with you, their armies go into your manpower pool. Um, update your manpower reserve to reflect your new totals if they changed from whatever this round. So our manpower reserve shows four plus three is seven. So we have three, four, five, six. So there's one more available. Whoops. Why are there cubes coming out of this? There we go. Seven. Refresh exhausted manpower and repair heavy ships and ports. Move half of exhausted, minimum of three, to available. So our exhausted guy comes back, which is good. I was getting a little upset about that. Um, Refresh all merchants. They go basically, they stand upright. So we're going to get rid of this. Add colonists to the colonist pool equal to the number of colonial claims on the board. Uh, each PR player may add a maximum of four. So it says colonial claims, or is that towns? It's claims. I don't have any more claims. Remove any cube from their changed mat focus slot and return it to the supply. And then there's some bots. So remove alliances from bots and DNPRs that have a tax income of 10 or more ducats. Remove all plague from the map board, a Dutch imperial to match the emperor. There's a first player token somewhere. And reset all status round markers to the event not taken space. Okay. Discard down to five action cards. End of age routine. We don't we don't have end of age yet, so we don't do that. So we're good. So now we gotta flip over to the bots. Because I was jumping through and finishing our turn. So we have Okay. Bots only perform the steps below. Refresh bot power. Discard all spent cubes and replenish available cubes according to the chosen difficulty available. So we're playing normal. So in phase four, they're going to gain seven. Bots gain plus one if they have 20 small or eight large towns in play, plus two of both. And then the Emperor is a bot. We're going to roll a die to see if it increases or decreases as described for NPR Emperors on page 45 of the main rules. So I'm going to have to flip to that. A bot Emperor then gains extra cubes. It's going to gain one cube if it has uncontested control. 
it also scores victory points equal to the number of Catholic PRs minus one. Okay, let's do it one step at a time. We're going to go ahead and discard everything spent, and we're going to replenish seven. That's actually pretty simple. I was expecting this to get a little bit more complicated, but it's not. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and... Basically, this one goes into the kitty. There's three, four, five, six, seven. This one goes into kitty. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven. Boom. Three, four, five. What do I do here? Do I grab two more? Uh, it's replenish, was the rule. So I'm going to say no. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and all of those are gone. Boy, that's a lot. Okay, let's go check the bot rules again and get clarification on this. Replenish available according to the chosen difficulty level. It says try easy level on your first bot game. I guess I didn't do that. <laughs> you know, everybody's like, I guess I was supposed to try like uh, just a one age game instead of a full campaign, a grand campaign with six bots or. <laughs> um, all right, um, we'll keep going. I don't know what replenish means. Replenish, do I grab new cubes? I mean, here it says gained. So gained would tell me, yeah, he gets two more from the kitty. So I'm going to go give him two more. I think, basically, they're supposed to always get seven, no matter where you get it from. So Austria is going to get one, two more. Now, it's also further complicated by the fact that he's the emperor. So let's check out his thing. So since he's the Emperor, uh, we're going to roll a die to see if this increases or decreases based on page 45. And we're going to gain the bot power equal to whatever the cube strength is that they're going to get by the current level. A bot Emperor gives one victory point if they're at six. He's not going to be at six. And so page 45 of the rule book is here. But the Emperor's controlled. The Emperor starts with three as usual. Roll a six-sided die. We rolled a three. So decrease the by one if the roll is two lower than the current one. Well, it's equal. Increase by one if it's two higher. So it just stays right where it is. Number of units to defend in each area. Yeah, we'll worry about that later. And then for the Curia. Okay. Um, if you have uncontested control, at least two cardinals, and the most with no tie, 
you receive points equal to the number of Catholic player realms minus one, but max three. So because all the bots are considered to be player realms for this purpose, uh, you know, you're going to get three points for being the controller. So let's go ahead and resolve that and three points goes to Poland. Austria is sitting here with zero points. Um, which one's Poland? This one. And Poland is running away with the game right now. Poland can be pretty powerful in the video game as well. Certain things have to go their way, but they can definitely get powerful. Okay, how are we doing? We're doing okay on time. This is... It'll be less painful as we get, you know, more comfortable with how this works. But there's a lot of steps, for sure. And you have to, like, slow down and make sure you didn't miss anything. So income, upkeep... So the plague thing was supposed to cause the bots to, to only generate half of their income. But what's funny is the plague didn't hurt the bots at all. <laughs> um, that's the only thing that, that bothers me with this. Uh, those plague tokens didn't do anything to the bots. It's like if we go down to the events, there's plague tokens somewhere in here. Maybe not. Yeah, see, they don't even have the play going here. Okay, I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything from a bot perspective. So, during the cleanup phase, oh, here we go. Update bots to match their town track. So we need their uh, manpower, basically, to match. Always return units from the manpower reserve to supply first. Bots gain colonists for claims. An alliance between bots expire. The Imperial influence. Imperial influence is adjusted to match the current level and redistributed uh, where it would require the least for the bot to get the most. Reshuffle the bot deck. Events are always reshuffled. Ideas are always reshuffled. Set aside bot cards that were used for the focus action. These are not reshuffled. Reshuffle half of the remaining used bot cards. Round up. Any cards that are not reshuffled are removed from the current. Okay, so half the cards. This was important to read this part here. So we got to do the events. That part makes sense. The ideas, I don't really understand that, why we would reshuffle ideas. Because um, I don't think I'm drawing new ideas. Oh, it's the event, I'm sorry. These are the uh, event cards from the bot deck. Events are always reshuffled. Ideas are always reshuffled. That were used for the focus action. Those are not reshuffled. And then the remaining used bot cards, half of them get shuffled. Round up. Okay, I think I got it. So this is the event bot deck card. All right. So if we go back to this, we're now at the bottom here, right? So. We have to discard down to five action cards. We, we only have one. And then uh, we're going to start the next round up here. So we're going to reveal the events. We're going to draw our action cards, three of any type. 
and then we can pay to keep action cards. It's two ducats per card. Um, that you didn't do when you started the game. So that's one of the key differences. So you have to pay to keep your action cards. Uh, and then you can pick, replace your missions um, if you wanted. And we're only drawing three action cards. That's interesting. So Okay. Sorry, I'm doing some thinking while I'm talking, and I know that makes for a boring and dull video. All right, um, let's do the bot phase here. So five plus seven is 12. And I'm sorry, <laughs> seven plus one is eight. So here you see we have three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Over here we have five plus five is ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's us. Five, I'm sorry, seven plus three is ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Four plus one is five. One, two, three, four, five. And then three more because they're the HRE. Seven plus one is eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so we did that part. Next, we're going to go ahead and search these. So it's saying that the event goes back. So no matter what, we put the event back into the deck. These cards are out because we're those were eliminated because of age one. And then, see, we have four of these here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip these. We're going to shuffle them. And we're going to draw one, two, and then the rest of these are out of the game. I don't know how to de designate out of the game. Let's put here. These are out of the game. I don't know what the eyeball means, but uh, those are out of the game. And then we're going to go ahead and shuffle it one more time, and now the bot deck's ready to go. That's what it was trying to explain. So we just got to go through all of these and do this nonsense. So uh, this was a conversion, a focus. So see the focus here? This stays out because the focus got played. So here, there's only two cards. So we're going to flip them. Shuffle them, and one goes in, the other one is out. And then shuffle. And it's out for the rest of the age, not the rest of the game. So technically I can take these ones and put them over there too. That's actually a good idea. So instead of having all these things just lingering, those are out for the age. Same here, out for the age. All right. Event. No matter what. Now this one is round down, remember? So uh, we're going to grab just one of these. Shuffle. One goes over. The other two out. And then shuffle, they're ready to go. So we just rinse and repeat here. Go to France. I'm trying to remember, what was the third one? It was, um, oh, ideas. 
I don't think they had any ideas in their deck. That's the part I don't understand. Maybe we just never drew one. So, um, okay, we're going to flip these and shuffle. And we're going to draw just one. Move it here. These are out. And so are all these. And then we're going to shuffle. These are out. Event comes back. We're going to flip. Shuffle. One comes over. The other two are out. Shuffle. And that brings us to the end. Okay. So, um, one last thing we got to do. Uh, these we're just going to push out of the way for now. This card is gone. It does not go back. So we have a, another seven cards, right? So these cards are now the new deck because this was, remember, it's the first half of age one. And so this is the new deck that would be used and um, it literally says we're going to draw three cards and reveal them. So I'm going to select these three cards and then we're going to flip them and then boom. There's our three. And right there, Iberian Wedding. Uh, bind the dynasties together. So, um, Castile and Aragon. Castile's going to gain one point. A royal marriage and an alliance with Aragon and four cubes in the Aragonese areas. Um, and look, I get a leader. Like, this solves all my problems, if I can take that. So that's a nice first thing to do. We might just grab an event right from the start. Now, um, we started, the first player was the Ottomans, so the first player is not going to be the French. Because if you remember, we did two bots and then we did our turn. Um, how do I indicate first player? That is a great question. And, ooh, what's this? Oh, NPR Cardinals. Interesting. Um, oh, right here. There's the first player marker. So uh, there we go. So first player is now going to be France. We'll just put it right there. All right. It's funny how I ask this question, and it's always been there. Um, okay. So what else do we need to do? Um, one thing I, I do need to do is I have to go through the rest of this deck and build the other... So this is just, we finished one quarter of age one. So if you're thinking, okay, this grand campaign game is long, it is. We finished one quarter of age one. After we do another round and everybody passes, we'll be done with the first half of age one. So that means I got to get 14 more cards out of here to make the next two decks for, for the second half of age one. I only bothered making the first half. And so that's one of the activities I can do. I can do that, you know, between videos. So I don't necessarily need to make you guys uh, watch me do that. Um, the These markers go away. I forgot to deal with that. Uh, beyond that, oh, um, I think I'm pretty sure these get reshuffled. Um, I'm going to have to check that. So let's do that right now. So while I was getting ready to, to check, the Imperial Authority token hasn't changed. They get plus one um, piece for, uh, for being here. Um, so that's one extra cube for Austria. So I need to make sure they get their extra cube because they're HRE Emperor. Okay. Peanut butter rules time again. Let's go back up to the beginning. So we do have like setup, but now we're gonna go and do, I think it's phase one or maybe it's cleanup. It should be a part of cleanup.
remove any tag chits, pass the first player token, reset all round status markers. Yeah, I gotta do that still. Disband all allied units. Manpower. Refresh all merchants. Dang it. Where's the part that you're supposed to shuffle, like, for example, the trade deck? Alright, I'm going to have to pause and I'm going to keep looking. Okay, so, a couple of things. The first one is that the unused event we are supposed to, before the round ends, resolve any of the symbols that are on the bottom. The unused event was the Polish event, and the bottom is just a leader. So in this case, nothing really happened to us. So um, we're good to go there. But that's something that you do have to remember to do. Um, any The event that's not used, after everybody passes, you resolve the symbols, like these symbols here. Those would get resolved at the bottom. All right, the next thing. It is illegal to have two merchants in the same trade node. So I was not allowed to go over to Genoa, so I would have had to do the Sevilla one. So I would have kept this here, and I could have moved this over, but that would not have given me any extra money. So I had to do fish. If you remember, um, I chose to do this trade node because it would have gotten me more money. Um, that was illegal for me to do. So I had to do fish instead, so I'm going to subtract two gold because uh, I gave myself seven income instead of five. So the fish income would have you know, been two less and then I would have activated that merchant. So um, I did not know that rule. Um, I didn't catch it when we did the action, but just wanted to make sure you knew you can never have two merchants in the same area. Um, other players can be there just fine, uh, but never the, the same player type. Alright, and why do I know these rules? Because I'm like going through trying to find um, when do I reshuffle these decks. So uh, these three get reshuffled when they're empty. And then you have to keep the top five in the discard pile, which I find interesting, um, but I think it's because you could, there might be some abilities to go and grab something from the discard pile. Um, so I'm going to assume that this is going to follow the same rules. We're going to keep drawing until it needs to be reshuffled. So we're not going to reshuffle this deck at this time. Um, oh, and check this out. I think these are actions that the guy built in. Sequence of play. Oh, these are rules? Oh, check that out. Yeah, let's get these out of here. Look at this. He actually has rules that we can look at up here. Oh my gosh, that's so nice. What else do we got? Sequence of play. Look at that. So when we do the Peace and Rebels phase, it's all right here. Oh my gosh. Beautiful. Yeah, that looks really nice. I almost like this more than the board game. <laughs> when the physical copy arrives. Alright, um... These are the symbols. Again. Awesome. What are that? The peace terms that we just finished going through. How trade works. Reveal trade card. Can discard and ignore steps. And game scoring. And then just plain old red. Very, very cool. I think we're going to put the event icons up because that's a good one to fall back on. Alright, super duper cool. Um, the guy who made this did a decent job. Um, okay, so uh, all that's left now is to start the new round. 
And I'm gonna basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do step one, and then when we're getting ready to start the action phase, I'm gonna end the video. So step one, we're gonna reveal the three events. We already did that. We're gonna draw some action cards, three of any type, and it's really gonna be just be me. So this is only the players. And then I have to pay two ducats per card to keep them. So I could pot pay potentially six ducats. And then um, you can replace missions, and you only ever have two in your hand. I'm I'm happy with the two I have, so I don't want to replace those yet. Although, I may want to, since the Iberian Wedding is up, I may want to grab the, the one... Here, let me show you. This one. Own or vassalize four provinces in Aragon and be at peace. Um... It's definitely a nice one, but I think I'm going to stick with the ones I have. Yeah, I'm going to stick with the ones I have. Okay, so which ones am I going to draw? Tough, tough, tough question. I think, you know, so the natural temptation is let's just draw one of each. I already have a military one here that I would like to use, and it would let me research military ideas twice. Um, I do lose the stability though for um, for playing this card just one time. It's not every time I do it. Um, so I feel like I already have a military card. So I'm going to go after one of these for sure. And I don't want to select draw because <laughs> that um, I'm going to get one of these for sure. And then the question becomes is which one am I going to get two of? And I think I want to get a second administration one. Ugh, I don't know. Administration is one of those things that, like, I favor that because it, it's just, it's so powerful. You need it for so many things. Um, the military one I would normally take, like I said, some of these could possibly be really good. I'm going to take another administration. So then we're going to select these three cards, flip them, and I didn't mean to... Oh, I see. We could use this to determine whose turn it is. <laughs> didn't even think about that. And we're going to go ahead and flip that over. Alright, so what do we get? Let's check it out. Exceptional year. You may remove unrest from one of your towns. And then you gain nine ducats. Ooh. It requires administrative skill total, ruler plus advisor, of at least three. Which is easy to do. And then you can see I have an advisor here of a plus two. But I already have it plus two advisors across the board. So I have to pay two ducats to keep this. That's the key thing to understand. So I'm really only getting seven if I do this. But I do get to remove one unrest. Um, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's going to cost me two cubes to play. So let's move on to the next one. Naval Traditions. Very similar to the other one. Um, I can place a pirate. I can build up to two ships per port. And get one ducat off per four ducats spent. So basically I can build ships for three ducats. And it's reminding me of a rule that I, I I didn't get it wrong, but I didn't explain it to you guys. You build one ship per port. So I happen to have one, two, three ports. So I can easily build three ships. Um, so my apologies there. Uh, <laughs> I told you we could buy you could buy unlimited. That wasn't quite true. So this would allow you to build two ships per port and get one ducat off. So basically you're buying it for three ducats each. Now we do have a mission to buy four chip ships in one action. So instead of it being 16 ducats, it would cost me 12. Um, that would be a way to get victory points because I would successfully finish that mission and it's like it's worth five victory points. It's a great option if I want to just finish a mission. Um, then the navigators. I can perform an explore action at no cost. 
Now that might be where this is worth it. So I would use one of these each time I did one of these things. And then remember, it, it still costs me a cube to do each of these. So I have to pay a cube to play the card, and then I have to pay a cube when I do each of these. Um, but the explore action would not cost me military cubes, because normally an explore action is one diplomacy, one military. Uh, that makes it actually quite valuable. So I could finish the mission for one of these, right? I can use one of these to finish the mission, and I can use the other three to get some uh, explore claims out so we can keep discovering the new world, right? And start getting some dominance out there. And then, um, unfortunately or fortunately, I got another exceptional year. So I got two identical cards just with different leaders on the bottom. Um, so I'd have to pay six ducats to keep all these. The, the only thing, like, so this is guaranteed money. Um, it's a guaranteed profit. The problem is it's a guaranteed I have to spend cubes. So I'd have to spend four of them. And I only have three. So that's one thing we got to keep in mind. If I keep the cards, I can keep them forever. Because remember when the round ended, I just have to discard down to five. So right now I'm sitting at a total of four. So I don't necessarily have to play them, you know, this age or this particular round. And I'm looking at the administrative actions. <clears throat> I'm not going to be colonizing. I'm not going to be converting an area, although I could be. If I actually won, I can convert them to our religion. And then right here, the increased ability is the one that I probably want to do. Because we're sitting here on minus one. It would cost me four cubes to move this up. Now what I was hoping for, and the reason why I drew two of these cards, is I was hoping one of them would have helped me to increase stability. Like, maybe one of these checkbox cards where one of the options was, hey, you could increase stability for just two cubes. That's what I was really hoping for, and I didn't get it. So, very sad about that. Um, and in fact, this one's going to make me lose a stability to play it. Uh, so, if I pay six ducats, I can get nine of them back for two of those cubes, and then I have one cube left over. <coughs> hmm. I guess that's not the end of the world. The The key thing I want to do is I want to get Isabel here. And look at her. Three, four, two. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I just had a one, one, one. Just look at how many more cubes I'm going to get when I have this leader. Then, of course, I don't want her to die. That's the other thing. Um, I mean, I'm looking over here to see if she's going to automatically get wounded by the event cards. And it doesn't look like that's the case. Um, this is of course an interesting one that's a that's the hungry um uh shield um this is an austrian card okay that yeah so austria shield that's an austria shield because um just like we have the iberian wedding this is the austria austrian uh card that they're looking for so this is a really good one. You get a personal union with Hungary, and basically they, they're they going to join you, which is sort of like what's going to happen here with Aragon. Now, we need diplomacy cubes to... Coming back to here. For diplomatic actions, we're going to have an alliance, and we're going to have... Uh, assuming we get the Iberian wedding, we're going to have the alliance, and we're going to have the marriage... So a lot of things are going to be in place for us. But then to integrate them, right, to basically annex them diplomatically, um, what is the... See, we don't have to worry about forging an alliance. Oh my gosh, where is it? I was
was fairly certain there was a way you can um, integrate diplomatically. Because basically you need to form Spain. Because uh, right now we're currently Castile. And Aragon and, and Castile, you know, historically at least, you know, they had the Iberian wedding and then uh, basically they merged together. So I'll have to look up where that is because I'm trying to find it now and I don't see it and I know it exists. I absolutely know it exists. So, um, one second. Okay, so this is actually quite tricky. And it took me quite a while to research. And in fact, it's super late at night, so I'm going to have to end very soon. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to keep all three of them. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm going to pay for the three cards. But here's what I learned. One of the things you may notice, I actually took out the Andalusian expansion mission. And instead I put claims in Aragon. So I need to own or vassalize four provinces in Aragon and be at peace. Um, this is in preparation for the Iberian wedding, which is going to put a lot of cubes on all the Aragonese spaces. But here's the deal. That doesn't do much for me. So Castile has an event here called Form Spain. And I need to own all the provinces. So this is how you form Spain, by the way. It's one of your missions. And I need to accomplish 1A first before I can do 2A. So as you can see here, I added 1A to my mission deck. So I need to do this first complete this mission, score the four victory points, and then I can come back and get 2A to continue my mission and form Spain. This is the only way um, you can do it. Well, sort of. And so then that would form Spain for me, and then um, you can see there's a lot of other things. Um, but here's the deal. The Iberian Wedding... It's going to actually create some unrest, and then I'm going to gain a victory point, and I'm going to get a royal marriage and an alliance with Aragon, and I'm going to get four cubes in the Aragonese areas. Four cubes is a lot of cubes. Don't get me wrong. To set this up without this card would take forever. First of all, the royal marriage costs a lot of cubes. The alliance costs a lot of cubes. And then to have four cubes in there, after setting up both of these, it's even more. Um... This is like a lot of gifts, you know, to be able to put that out there. Um, if I choose B, which of course is what happens if somebody else were to choose this for me, I would lose a victory point, I have to discard two cubes from Aragon, but I do gain a stability, and one cube in Portugal, and I would gain uh, a diplomatic cube. So, so here's the deal. If the Iberian wedding were to fall through and somebody else selected it, and they chose option B, you at least get some benefit. I mean, you're going to get Isabel no matter what, because you you have a right to take it. Um, I think if somebody else played the card, you have to pay two ducats to be able to claim Isabel. But here's the deal. Um, you're basically declaring war, and you're going to merge them that way. That's your only other option, is, is you're going to just take them the hard way. And then whenever you declare that war, you would vassalize them. Or I guess you could just annex them. That would work too. Um, so here's the... So let's assume that you are doing it diplomatically. Um, there's one thing I wasn't aware of, and it's crucial. And that is, this deck right here, the diplomatic deck, has a card in it called Subjugate. And you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six of them in the deck. Subjugate. You discard cubes from your NPR vassal equal to the base tax. And then you vassalize your ally. Or annex your vassal. Right there. Or one tax ally. And there it is. You could either make them a vassal or you can just flay up. If they are a vassal already, you can annex them. And so... Um, or if they were just a one-tax ally, you could 
you could annex them directly. You don't have to vassalize them. So you would have to do this to vassalize Aragon. Um, I almost said Aragorn. Um, so if you vassalize them, that counts. You get the Claims in Aragon mission complete. I need that card. I don't have that card. And so I would need a blue card to be drawn by me to be able to do it. It is pure luck to get that freaking card. And then um, in here, you need to own all provinces. It's not vassalized, you need to own them. So that means after you vassalize them, then you would have to convert them. And then and only then do you form Spain. So I went and grabbed this mission, but I don't even know if I can do it. Um, I am not going to be, you know, I'll have an alliance with them. I will have a royal marriage with them, but I will not have them vassalized. And the only way I can vassalize is to play that subjugate card, which I don't have. And so um, I'm starting to not like some of the design of this game. Like, in order to accomplish my mission, I have to depend on random luck. And and what it means is, is instead of grabbing these other cards, I need to just grab three of these blues and keep grabbing three blues until I get the subjugate card. And technically, I need two subjugate cards if I want to really continue this mission. I just don't need the second one as quickly as I need the first one. So um, it's rather disappointing, if you ask me. Um, but that's part of playing Castile. Uh, another thing I so when I play this game I like to play England a lot um, I also like to play Russia um, so I chose to play Castile this Iberian wedding is always tricky even in the video game because sometimes the event doesn't occur because uh, it requires basically um, you need to have a royal marriage with Aragon so that's one of the things you gotta always have set up and then of course um, you need the wedding and then their leader needs to die and so then you just inherit the whole thing and then boom, it just all becomes a part of your empire and you don't have to lift a finger. But sometimes the RNG of the game, it doesn't happen that way. So you're depending on a lot to form that Iberian wedding, uh, at least diplomatically, which is what happened historically. And so, you know, you do sometimes want to make it work. Like when you play as Austria in the video game, sometimes Hungary will form a political union with you immediately. And there's times, like, as England, I ended up getting France for free. All of it, as a personal union. It was crazy. Um, so it is possible. You can inherit some pretty large things, but you just need a lot of luck to go your way, too. So, you know, I guess that's that way here in the board game. Like, is it the end of the world that I don't get Aragon? Do I really need to form Spain? I guess not. Um, but from a fun factor... I like being able to form Spain, just like, you know, England would like to be able to form Great Britain. You know, it's that kind of thing. And I'm sure they actually have a Great Britain mission in their in their deck. Um, you know, France needs to form historical France, right? You know, it's just that kind of concept. All right, um, I kept all of them. Uh, we're ready to rock and roll. I'm going to get these dice out of here. Just put them over here so they're out of the way. And uh, we will start the game with France as the first player. They'll take their action. Hopefully they're not going to draw an event <laughs> and then take ours. And then uh, we are going to take Iberian Wedding, absolutely, without a doubt. Um, although I totally confess, since we don't have Subjugate, maybe I should just declare war on them and do it the hard way. Um, but I, I also... I do lose a point, but I'm going to gain a stability, which that costs a lot of cubes. And then I also gain a relationship with Portugal. I don't know. I mean, there's some there's some good and bad with both of these. If I declared war on them, the problem with them, and this is the same in a video game, is you got these dang islands that belong to them. So I may control the mainland, but that's not a total victory. I have to go take this, I have to take this, I have to take Sicily and Malta, and that's 
what it would take to have a total victory. So um, if I have a partial victory, they're not going to give me their capital. And so that I need this main land to be able to take them completely. And also in the video game, it's interesting because Navarra is its own little province. And sometimes it's a it's really difficult to get Navarra um, because they might ally with France, you know, and then, you know, you want to take them over, but you can't. Um, so it's interesting how they just get lumped into this one area. Um, they are their own little entity, but, you know, from an NPR perspective, if I declare war and have a claim in here, I'm declaring war and all, all of them are going to... So basically, Navarra is allied with them, basically. So all four of them are going to rise up against us. So, uh, again, not the end of the world. I'm still having a blast. I think the, the video game concepts are very well implemented. I'm, I'm definitely seeing it in action. The NPRs are uh, very passive. I wasn't expecting the NPRs to be so passive. So that's a little gripe I have with the game. But at the same time, if they weren't passive, oh my gosh, how much longer would this game take to play? So I, I totally understand the give and take there. Um, and as far as like their passiveness goes, it's still very interesting how they do behave whenever they do actually take actions. I think my biggest disappointment is this DNPRs. Um, these dynamic ones haven't done anything so far, other than um, we did form one somewhere. Where did it go? There we have this. Oh, right here. Naples formed. Um, I think it's a cool idea. Uh, so far they haven't done much of anything, but yeah. And they just, you know, pose another potential challenge or whatever as you're doing things. And yeah, that's right. We have the Canary Islands. Um, I think that covers it. So if there's any questions or comments, uh, please let me know. Uh, I know that I corrected some mistakes right here uh, near the end. Um, and again, I apologize for the declaring war on my own ally. <laughs> that part um, is a little crazy. In fact, I gotta I'm gonna get rid of this. We're not at war anymore. So. There we go. So we got the alliance going. All right. Um, thanks for watching. Stay awesome. Frosthaven is still on my table. Um, it takes a long time to set up those scenarios. It is so nice to just sit down and play a video game and not have to, you know, set things up all the time. So uh, thank you for letting me and in, indulging me in this other new game while I was in the middle of playing something else. Um, I'm having a blast. So thanks for watching. Stay awesome.